Oh, so great to have you, Dr. Ashley. Thank you for noting that. Hi, I'm Lorraine Cantley. I am a social justice activist. I am also co-founder of the Housing Justice LA podcast, and I find healing through the advocacy, and I do that by way of many platforms. Uh, being a CSH Speak Up advocate is one. Also, uh, a core team member with the Domestic Violence Homeless Services Coalition, and that's just to name a few, and I'm really glad to be here. Hello, my name is Rhiannon Diaz. Um, I'm a CSH Speak Up advocate and CSH Speak Up intern in quality supportive housing and racial equity. And hi, everyone. My name is Saba Muine. She, her, hers. Uh, I, some of my identities, uh, I am an African woman and immigrant, um, half Egyptian and half Ugandan. Uh, I have a career of civil rights work, um, and um, some of the work I do uh, specifically here at CSH is uh, racial, racial equity training. So thank you so much. I'm so uh, honored to be among these incredible panelists. So just to cover real quickly our agenda for, for today, we're just going to spend a few more moments on the welcome and introductions before we go into a section around data, history, stories, and community. Um, and then uh, we'll unpack more deeply uh, racial trauma and healing practices. So again, an invitation just to notice how you're feeling in your body throughout this. Um, I think part of this work is just to build that, that um, to continue to practice that awareness. Um, and, and in terms of questions, we hope to get to the quest Q and A, we have so much excellent content. Um, we ask you to please type your questions into the chat box. Um, and for the questions that we we know we have a lot of folks on the call today, so we won't be able to um, get to certainly most of. We won't be able to get to all the questions for sure. We'll try to get to some, and then for the ones that we're not able to, we will be communicating uh, some responses to to some of the questions via communication from our training center. So we wanted to start with this opening proverb uh, from some of my ancestors. And uh, so I'll just read it. True teaching is not an accumulation of knowledge. It is an awakening of consciousness, which goes through successive stages. So this is basically an invitation for us um, to think of our anti-racist work as an awakening into a new collective consciousness that's, that's really ever evolving. And so it's, it's really an honor to be on this journey, um, this collective journey with you, um, our, our, our shared community throughout, throughout the nation. And we want to respect and we want to recognize that indigenous people are the traditional stewards of the land. And so we have a land acknowledgement. There's a link there at the bottom. Um, if you would like to go on and check into the land that you're residing on, please do so. Uh, as for me and the, my co-facilitators here, we are on Tongva land and we show gratitude and appreciation for that. Thank you. Um, I've just been, I hope that you guys can see me. I don't know whether we're having some issues with my video. Um, but just to, okay, great. Thank you. So, but just to continue that, that honoring um, of, of our ancestors um, and, and welcoming for all of us in this space. Uh, so acknowledging the first people who, who lived um, on this land and um, that, you know, we're welcoming you to, to go ahead and click on that link to find out who the first people are um, in the land that you stand. But um, calling their wisdom into this space, um, honoring our African-American foremothers and fathers 
for building this nation um, and this economy that we've enjoyed for hundreds of years. And then an honoring to immigrants, new and old, from all over the globe, who have contributed to our rich society. And I, and I use that word rich in both senses of the word. Um, and then a welcoming to all of the identities that are represented on this call, marginalized um, or mainstream. And so we want to start with the uh, definition uh, of trauma, just to contextualize this entire conversation. I think many of us, I uh, see a lot of uh, uh, providers likely on this call. Uh, many of us are familiar with the term trauma as uh, a deeply disturbing or distressing experience that has a physical and psychological dimension and really exceeds an individual's ability to, to cope and that capacity. Uh, and, and it can be an acute event or chronic event, uh, whereas racialized trauma is defined as and the, def the definition rather that we're using for today, and both, these are both definitions that we're using for today, um, complex trauma, so that's ongoing, uh, from the ongoing experience of oppression and subordination, mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination, racism and hate crimes, Many marginalized identities are charged with navigating both trauma plus, plus racialized trauma. So there's, that, there's this intersection uh, um, of, of trauma and racialized trauma. And one area that we see that in is in the black indigenous people of color who experience homelessness in our nation. So in every state in our country, black people are more likely to experience homelessness than white people. At a minimum, black people are 1.0 times more likely to experience homelessness than white people in the state of Mississippi, according to this data from NAH. And at a maximum, they're 16.4 more times likely to experience homelessness in the state of Minnesota. But across our country, people of color are experiencing homelessness um, in, at greater rates than their percentage in the overall population. So we see Native Americans as 1.3% of the U.S. population, yet they're represented at 3% in the population of people experiencing homelessness in our country. Uh, similarly with Black Americans, 13% in the U.S. population, yet 40% in the homeless population. And with the data we have on Latinx, the, our Latinx uh, brothers and sisters, the, um, it, that data is most likely to be undercounted. There was a study that was done here in Los Angeles uh, by uh, Dr. Melissa Chinchilla that said that Latinx communities are least likely to be engaged in homelessness services and therefore least likely to be counted. Um, and that's because of barriers such as immigration status and, and cultural and language barriers. So barriers. So, um, so we see racialized trauma in the form of um, being it, it, the experience of being an immigrant and, and you know, blocking that fear, blocking people from accessing services. So another area that, and another uh, news that we've been seeing uh, very clearly uh, now is that uh, in this pandemic, black and brown people are disproportionately impacted. So I've heard of it being referred to as a double pandemic. So the, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the, the racial pandemic that, that folks are experiencing. We know that frontline workers are overwhelmingly people of color. Um, and it's true that uh, Native Americans and black people are five times more likely to be hospitalized or experience death from COVID-19. And Latin, Latinx Americans are four times more likely. So we see that intersection of trauma and, and racialized trauma, and you have to ask yourself why. So this was uh, supposed to be a policy snapshot, but it looks more like a panorama because I have a lot of information on here for you, simply because um, our history with racial trauma and oppression is long and it's foundational to, um, to our, our, our country and our nation. So Brian Stevenson um, tells it very accurately in this quote by saying, slavery didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. And we have all these policies that, that, that show us how. Um, enslaved black people and later un, 
on or underpaid labor of or the underpaid the on or underpaid labor labor of racialized identities created the wealth of this nation, but however, have always been the least wealthy among us. And racism really is a system designed to build and maintain white supremacy, which is used to control black and brown bodies in order to maintain a racialized underclass um, where, where the wealth from, from that is held primarily in white communities. So policies have been explicitly and implicitly marginalizing people of color Whereas if we were to look at all of the American policy, we, we could look at it from the perspective of, of being 400 years of affirmative action for white identified people in our nation. And some of the uh, explicit policies that really stand out, of course, for this conversation is the 13th Amendment, which um, in, um, involuntary, uh, neither slavery nor involuntary ser servitude except as a punishment for crime. Um, redlining, war on drugs, um, and we see that this is also intergenerational if we think about the, you know, the many years uh, of our country. So that means generations experiencing racialized tra uh, trauma, and, and much of this is, is connected to that labor piece, which, which we'll um, continue to see. So one of the things that um, when we start to talk about intersectionality and we start to talk about um, racial disparities and differences. It's super important that we clarify the difference between disproportionality and disparity, right? Disproportionality refers to the representation, the numbers of how many people show up in a particular service or system as it relates to their numbers in the population, right? So we see many more numbers of people of color in some of these systems than we do at, as the number of them in the population. But disparities have to do with the differences in treatment. Right, so people get, so we have tons of research that say, for example, while black people represent about 4% of the population, they represent, like Saba was talking about, a significant number of folks in, the, in homelessness. Um, and, and when we talk about system involvement, we're talking about child welfare system, we're talking about health system, we're talking about legal system, we're talking about education, we're talking about housing. Um, and so what we know is that the more vulnerable that you are, right, the more intersectional uh, identities you have, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but the more different you are, um, the more likely that you are to be involved in one of those systems in a less positive way. And the more likely that you are involved in that, the more likely that you're going to get disparate or, or less than positive treatment. Um, so we want to be aware of our consumers who are more um, marginalized because they are likely to be treated more poorly than other folks. Mm, thank you. And so um, we know that racism is foundational to uh, our society and therefore exists in all systems in, in some form, whether that be um, explicit, explicitly or implicitly noted. I know a lot of the outcomes, uh, the disproportionality outcomes that, that uh, Dr. Wendy just mentioned is a way that we can see evidence of that. Um, but I think it's important for us uh, to examine the racist history of the um, profession that we're holding, because that ideolo ideology often maintains itself. Um, and so although systems may lo no longer tout the, the same explicit racist policies, and in, and in this case, quote unquote, science, um, more often than not, a racialized legacy is maintained. So I just pulled some information around uh, mental health in the United States. Uh, as it intersects with racism and, um, you know, there's these definitions which seem so absurd to us but is, is noteworthy um, because I know, for example, um, this idea of, of the cure of this, this, this false, um, this false mm -hmm. disorder of negritude, which is this like such an absurd word to me, um, was the only cure was becoming white. That's something that sits in our psyche as, as black people. You know, this thing about white being the, the, you, the only kind of way to be good and, and to be healthy in this context. And then also this, this piece around trauma being used as a, um, violence being used as a therapeutic intervention um, 
to to people trying to run away from from oppression, which would be anyone's natural instinct. Um, and then the the symptoms of of this one disorder being um, in, in skin lesions, and then just not connecting that to the fact that people were were treated so brutally and and violence um, experienced violence by by whipping um, in the context of slavery. And so the the census records, which are interesting, um, after slavery showed an, uh, an increase of people experiencing mental health crises, um, and it was attributed to uh, the removal of hygienic constraints, uh, and that black people no longer had control over their appetites and pa and passions, rather than noting um, that that people were in extreme uh, abject poverty and experiencing the terrorism of, of slavery. And again, we see this theme around labor where the, quote, the patients of, of this me uh, mental health uh, institution were the physical, physical labor um, and, and in some cases often built the mental institutions in which they were meant to be the patient. So it's again replicating this the slavery in the context of, of quote unquote treatment. And so can, can, we want to throw something in real fast. Oh yeah, please do. I was just gonna say that like we're we're focusing on African Americans for this slide, but I want to just be clear that you could look under any marginalized group and find a history like this. I mean our mental health yeah. system pathologizes anybody that is different. So like we just took being gay out of the DSM in like the eighties. <laughs> Right? We just took in 2013 gender dysphoria, which pathologizes trans and non-binary people in 2013. So the reality is that, and we just added in 2013, that being a target of perceived discrimination as something to be concerned about diagnostically. So just to recognize that our mental health system is absolutely steeped in a history of, of white supremacy and doesn't include people, representation of people of color. Sorry. No, oh, no, that's so important, and it's it's really vital to hear that um, coming from your background in this uh, deeply in the field of mental health, and and uh, and I would argue like most systems have, really all systems have that foundation of white supremacy, but the way that it's manifested um, might be slightly different in every in every system. And so thank you for naming that specificity. And so just to talk on a little bit the history of um, African Americans with police, um, and, and I, I think the, what, what Dr. Wendy said about we're, we're often talking about African Americans because the disproportionality and, and also the representation in, in marginalized communities is so high for African Americans. Um, and, and that disproportionality is extremely high, too, for Native Americans. Um, but, but certainly all other racialized identities have experiences with, this, with the white supremacist system. And so we're just using it as kind of a baseline. Um, but the, we know that the, the state-sanctioned racialized violence has continued, has not stopped since slavery. And the early history of the police is, is deeply linked with that violence. And it continues today through the institution of policing. And so I'm sure many of us know, or just to share that the, you know, the first kinds of police were slave patrols. And then Jim Crow laws were enforced by a more formalized police. So, so, and so that violence is very real and, and has not stopped. And it's important to note too that um, well, I think we've talked a little bit about quite a lot about systemic racism in our conversation today, but but that there are many dimensions of racism. And I want to share a personal story um, around one of my experiences. So as a child, I grew up um, I grew up all over in Africa, Egypt, Uganda, and the U.S. But my first ten years was in um, was in Virginia, and we were like the only black family, like for miles, for miles, like that. And in school, like, I didn't even have any other black friends. So um, we, w the school once insisted that they wanted to test myself and my brother for, um, for like, uh, learning disabilities. And, did, and my mom disagreed and, and disallowed them to do that. 
but then they did it anyway, right? So, so that was an experience that I had um, in the context of the educational system, so that's systemic. And the institution of my school, so that's institutional. And the interpersonal experience I had with my teacher who was administering this test without my, my mother's permission. Um, and then for me, the internalized oppression that then I had to unpack um, as I got older and I look back on this experience and realized you know, that I thought that there was something wrong with me and that that was internalized and then associated with being um, um, really the, one of the only black children in my school. And the foundation for that, like we said earlier in the history slides, is, is the ideology of white supremacy as being the basis of these systems that we interact with. So it, it exists on multiple dimensions. And so the killing of George Floyd has brought us to a catalytic moment and spurred this international uprising. But for black families in America, this phenomenon has been ongoing and really hasn't stopped since slavery. Um, and even since the tragic and violent murders and dare I say lynchings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, many other people, black people have already died. In the, in the hands of, of, of police and, and the experience, the trauma and the experience of violence and death in the hands of an institution that's supposed to protect you. Um, and some of those people are children. You know, some of those people are our children that have, that have died and perished and by the hands of police. And not to mention, you know, past victims that we know about, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Another child, he was a child. Um, I, I didn't let my son play with toy guns because I, I didn't know who was gonna see that and, and think that he was dangerous. Um, and, and you know, as, as a mother of a black son, I think about it every day. And so that is a form of trauma, knowing that my son's teenage behavior out in the world might be seen as violent and there isn't anything I can do to really protect him from that. And then watching these videos, he saw it before I could even talk to him about it. But the videos themselves are incredibly traumatic. I mean, as necessary as they are, they're incredibly traumatic. Um, and then for those of us that have had experiences with police, seeing this, like negative experiences with police, seeing these images are triggering. And so, um, so it's, it's good to be in community to talk about this today and I'm gonna, um, now pass it on to my colleague and dear friend, Rhiannon. Hello. Um, in my younger years, I suffered badly from a, from a series of things like anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, addiction, and an unhappy living situation while I was living with my dad and his girlfriend, my step monster. During that time, I experienced one of the most traumatic events that ever happened to me. In an argument with my step monster, one night, she called the police on me without me knowing. When I grabbed my keys to leave and get some air, three or four police, co police cars pulled in front of my house. They asked, Miss Diaz there? When I opened the locking door, I was grabbed and pushed to the floor. Of course, I was screaming because it was the most terrifying thing to happen to me. And when my cuffs were, ha when the cuffs on my hands were so tight, and they got rough with me, I panicked. I just remember being face down with my head turned and what seemed to be a boot on the side of my head. Then they put me in the police car and drove me to the hospital where they tried to take me into a hospital room with this doctor. I did everything I could, of course, not to go in the room because I was, I was not told or even given any information of what they were gonna to do to me in there. And of course, the fact that I was paranoid schizophrenic I did not want to go in a room that looked like a jail cell with no windows. When they gave up trying to get me into the room, they put me in the police car again and took me to the station. When we got there, I was afraid to get out of the car. Still, I was terrified. They were videotaping the whole thing, and, it, and again, although they were supposed to be the good guy, I could not understand why they were using so much force and why they were being so rough with me. Who was I going to have to protect me from them? When I, when I wouldn't get out of the car because of sheer terror, a, 
a female police officer grabbed me by the legs and dragged me all the way from the other side of the back seat of the police car while I still had my cuffs on. At that moment, I had great terror that I was going to get my skull fractured or fall on my teeth while falling out of the police car and, and have them break on the cement. I had made a safe landing out of the police car and three or four officers with uh, two, and two with rifles and of course the cameraman were around me. They wrestled me and hogtied my feet to my hands behind me and carried me that way to an empty jail cell. While they were carrying me, I had urinated in my jeans and my jeans slipped down. They left me standing in a jail cell with my pants soiled and down to my ankles and my hands still cuffed, handcuffed extremely tight. Again, frightened because they had male officers checking on me. With so many thoughts, I felt like they could come in and do anything to me and no one would ever know. They left me cuffed like that for around two or three hours. The next morning, I was released. All that for an overnight stay. They had taken me to the hospital again to be sure nothing broken or injured because I could barely move because my body hurt. Both my wrists and my hands were swelled and sprained and were the size of baseballs. Aside from that, I also had a lot of bruises. In this traumatic experience, I can't help but to think this could have been handled differently by a trained professional who was not defensive towards me. I was not a dangerous criminal and I didn't have any weapon. At that time, I needed guidance and a way to head in a different path. I felt like, I felt like when the police knew I had a mental disability and addiction, they in sort treated me as if I was not human anymore or like I wasn't going to remember this later. Although I was under the influence, I had never had a rough hand on me like that before and it had bothered me for some time after that. Being that I'm a woman and a woman of color, I can't tell you just how much fear I had of being hurt like that again. I have, no, I have nothing against the police, but a compassion and a kind hand in understanding and guidance would have been much better than that traumatizing, tough love force. Today, I'm in supportive housing, and I have a little one bedroom to myself and my support animal. She's a weenie dog. Um, I eat healthy and exercise to help with my mental condition. I'm in NA recovery, and I have been a success story for programs promoting reentry. The reentry programs and case managers have been a big stepping stone to my recovery from this trauma, and I have, and have drastically helped in the healing process. So um, I'd just like to go over my slide. Um, so pretty much what would, what would be um, great uh, to, you know, have some police reform and, and having um, providers trained in crisis response to handle mental, case, mental health cases, um, reform in crisis response as, so as to not cause trauma, and more f funding for uh, community providers and healers uh, to provide ongoing public health services for community members. Thank you so much, Sri, for sharing such a um, intimate experience and uh, of your trauma um, and so grateful to learn from your suggestions about how community can comport ourselves differently and how um, we can think about having crisis response, people that are trained in mental health crisis response um, to, to respond to calls um, so that so that folks don't experience more trauma um, in their experience of trauma, um, so that it's not compounding. Um, and so we'd just like to welcome Lorraine to share with us his, um, her thoughts. Yes, thank you so much, Rhiannon. Um, you have a, a great gift of bringing us into the world of experience through storytelling and um, it's powerful and 
There's power in your story and there's power in the reimagining of what can happen based on some clear action items that you've shared with us. So thank you. Um, I myself, I'd like to give us a, a, an opportunity to take a look at how there are histories attached to the people that are seeking services. Um, so back in the 1980s, I would tend to my dad's wounds after the police would drop him off and they would say, keep him in for the night. Uh, there was an excusable way of saying, well, he's a gang member and a drug dealer. So what happens to him due to the hands of the police is not, um, not as serious as someone who is, is, um, is not involved in the gang or doesn't sell drugs. When my dad shares with me the story of how the police would strategically place him in a community to sell his drugs or to, to organize for the sake of their purpose. And then they would at some point just decide we want to keep him in for the night and they would take his drugs and take his money and they would beat him up real good and they would drop him off at our house. Um, in 1998, I experienced my brother being murdered, and still to this day, it's an unsolved case. The detective that was on his case was moved from his case after we found out that his best friend, who was murdered along with him, which was a white boy, his family was told information and said, do not tell us anything, and they moved out of the neighborhood. This is the history. If providers knew history, if they had some idea of the history of those that they serve, then maybe they would be able to make a different decision on how they handle situations. Two years ago, a 17-year-old black male who was suffering from PTSD after being shot and don't know who shot him went to school. Prior to this day of going to school, this child, his parent, and the school staff sat down together for a safety planning, understanding that this child did not feel safe. The school staff would say, well, he's, he's a good kid, and he's so smart, and he's always doing great things. We don't see why it's so hard for him. Until one day, he was found trying to commit suicide on campus. And the response of the camp of the staff at the school was to call the police, to have the police cuff him, place him in the back of their police car, and transport him to a psychiatric hospital. Based on extreme advocacy, a family member was able to pick this child up and transport him to the hospital. Had the staff put that safety plan into action, this advocacy would have not had to happen in that sort of way. That child would have been attended to by the safety plan people that were put into this idea of how we would keep this child safe. When we think about the community members and the ways that they could be trained in these responses, there are what they call CAT teams, community action teams. This is where they teach you how to go out as teams and do crisis response. They teach you how to do escalate, how to do de-escalation. They teach you how to navigate crisis how to respond to a so, psychosocial crisis, uh, how to recognize emotional suffering, how to do safety planning and interventions, how to create personal safety plans and crisis planning, and also spend time with just elaborating on your social support. Now, there's a lot of talk about defunding the police. 
And so I'd like for folks to think about when there's this conversation of defunding the police, how are we advocating for the reallocation of these dollars to support these communities of color, to support these community action teams, to support inclusive therapists, to support the work of advocacy. Remember, if it had not been for the advocacy, that boy would have not been okay with returning back to school after him being hospitalized in the psychiatric hospital. There could have been a lot more danger upon his life. If we as community, we as providers, if we employ our ability to be advocates, then we can also help in the solution <clears throat> to the healing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larray, for that powerful um, recommendations and and for sharing with us your experience with your father and and that story with that child. I think it's, it really makes it um, real when we can use examples of how things should have been handled. And I think the crisis response team is a wonderful way. I agree to to use money coming from the police um, to support community members um, and to support communities of color. And so I'll pass it on now back to Dr. Wendy. So thank you both. Thank you all for your personal stories. I realize I don't have any personal stories. I want to start talking about things. <laughs> I have stories too. Um, you know, I loved your comment, um, Larray, a couple seconds ago about the defunding of the police, because I think that sometimes when we when we're looking for solutions, and we're all looking for solutions, right? Um, that we come up with sort of something, something, something specific, like defund the police or um, you know train the police. Um, I'm participating in, a, in an initiative now, which is working towards training the police. And I have to tell you that the research shows that training alone does nothing to change people's behavior. Nothing, um, because whatever biases you have existed before that. And the systems that we have in place promote this kind of thinking. That's what, that's what Saba was talking about with that diagram with oppression existing in all of those different perspectives, right? It exists on an individualized, internalized level. It exists on an interpersonal level, systemic level. So if we're going to look at the problem as nuanced, we have to also look at the solution as nuanced, right? Um, because these, these systems in place really support them. You know, um, this, this slide, this graphic really shows some of the more privileged identity versus those that are more marginalized and, and um, subordinated. And so, you know, really what, what's funny about this world that we live in is that the, the privileged identities have nothing to do with what you really are. They have to do with what you look like. Um, and the reality is a lot of these are invisible. So if you appear to be white, there are privileges that go along with that. If you are appearing to be male and masculine, there are privileges that go along with that. If you appear to be heterosexual, whatever that means, you are um, in, a, in an identity class that gives you more privilege. Um, however, those with more marginalized uh, identities, those that are queer, those that are trans, those that are people of color, those that are, are feminine, those that are uh, undocumented, those that are older, are all fo folks that have um, a different task in life, right? That, that they, are, they have to prove themselves. They have to be credible. Um, they are questioned in a different way, as Saba's example told us. Um, what this means is that these are all things that contribute to racialized trauma. These are all stories that we, all of us have stories. We can sit here for the next five hours and talk about our stories with the police. I can tell you about how I was pulled over and put at gunpoint. Like we all have these stories. And so those stories promote, promote us responding in a couple of ways. For many of us, they promote our silence, right? They promote us being quiet because we know if we say anything, it's just going to be worse. And, and that silence is part of the reason why we're dying at higher rates than anybody else, because it's creating health conditions and mental health conditions that are not getting addressed. The other response is when we can't take it anymore, it, um, we, we engage in violence, <laughs> and then we're punished even harder. 
And so part of the challenge is not only while we're managing our communities and while we're managing our police and we're dealing with our mental health, it's also giving ourselves voice. Um, because those two positions, those binary positions, those polarized positions of silence and violence, keep us from being heard and they keep us um, silent. And that's not what we want. That was it. <laughs> that was a lot, I know. Yes, it's definitely a lot. A whole lot. Uh, so we just like to take uh, uh, a moment to ask you how you're feeling in your body right now. I know we talked about that at the beginning of the call and we went through um, a lot in the first part of our session with the history, the violence, our personal experiences, that piece about how um, there is so much nuance in this and it feels it, it's, it's heavy. And so we, we just want you to notice, and, and if you don't, you know, if you don't notice any changes, there's nothing wrong with that either. But um, because trauma is physical, we just want you to sort of check back in with yourself and see what your body is doing. And um, as, we, as we start to move into discussing trauma in more depth and healing in more depth, we want to take a moment to um, to practice together that reflection um, uh, of, of what's happening in your heart, hands, and, and, and mind, and body. And, um, and we also want to just take a moment to, to uh, practice a meditation together, as um, I know something I use on a daily basis to kind of manage um, being in this world as a, as a black woman. And so if you can, um, go ahead and get comfortable, um, get your feet grounded, and find the natural poise of your spine, which means your core might be slightly engaged. Relax your shoulders. And if you're able to, uh, close your eyes and put your hand on your belly and your hand on your heart. And go ahead and take some breaths that expand your belly. And try taking a breath that expands both your belly and your chest. And go ahead and take another one and release it with sound. <sighs> and then if you are able to keep your eyes closed, go ahead and um, point your eyes in the direction of the center of your forehead. Um, and you can put your focus there or you can simply just notice your breath. And slowly wiggle your toes. Stretch out your hands. Open your palms wide. And 
and come back to our virtual circle. Notice how you feel in your body now. And know that this is a practice that you can also do in community. I know we have lots of providers. Obviously, many of you have heard, you know, and use this as a tool. Um, but, but just want to remind you that this is a, a tool to manage racialized trauma and oppression as well. So, um, and it's very powerful done individually and extremely powerful I think this is probably the biggest group I've meditated with in my life. <laughs> so I have so much gratitude. Thank you so much. That's the, this is the experiential part of our uh, webinar, and we might have some more. So I'll, I'll hand this one over back to Dr. Wendy. So funny because one of the things, uh, as we were preparing for this this workshop, one I, one of the things I was saying to the group is that when I when I tell my clients to engage in meditation, they always look at me as though I have like two heads, right? Like who meditates? And and one of the the reasons why we wanted to build it in here is is for the acknowledgement and the recognition of how powerful it is that you have the capacity, moment by moment, to calm yourself down. That is really important because we can't control the environment. We can't control the police. We can't control a lot of things. What we control is us. We can't control us. So the other thing I was going to say for this slide is that I don't know about you, but I learned as a little kid that I was not supposed to tell people that I was uncomfortable. And so if people said, how are you? I would say, I'm great. And, and, and for a lot of people of color, there's this expectation that we are stoic. We're fine. We're good. And unfortunately, after a while, we're not always able to identify when we're not okay. So what we wanted to include in this slide, absolutely, Jessica, for black women in particular, um, what this slide are some things to pay attention to. These are warning signs that you're getting tired, that you're fatigued, that you're, that you're, you're not completely broken down, but you might be losing some traction. So if you can't shake grief, that has been going on for a while. If you are super anxious, and you know, by the way, we're in a quarantine and there's a lot going on, so you're gonna be anxious. So I'm, I'm wanting to normalize those things, but when you notice that you are not recovering, when you are not snapping back, there's not a level of resilience, when things aren't funny anymore, um, that's an emotional symptom, right? All of us, I don't know anybody who's not engaging in behavioral maladaptive coping skills right now. Like, I may have a glass of wine multiple days a week. Okay, I admit it. I may eat cake after every meal. Um, but, but when you notice, again, right, we're talking about recovery. So if you are avoiding calling people back, if you are hiding from the people you love, you are isolating. Those are behavioral symptoms. Okay, if you're having physical or physiological symptoms you've never seen before, headaches that occur more frequently, your, your heart not just goes up, but stays kind of at an elevated state, the racing of the heart, heartburn, stomach, GI issues, right? Those are physiological and physical symptoms. Most of us, the first thing that happens that we know something is wrong is we have cognitive symptoms. We get cynical. We get negative. We can't concentrate, right? Oh, God, I can't remember anything. I keep forgetting where I put my keys. I keep forgetting to do this and that. Right, those are those are those are our cognitive symptoms. One of the biggest ones for helping professionals is to get caught up so much in our clients' lives that we think about them all the time, and we don't even think about our own lives, right? Um, and then the one that I think we talk about the least is the spiritual stuff, right? Not feeling hopeful. A lot of you talked about that in the chat: feeling hopeless, feeling disconnected, feeling purposeless. Those are spiritual symptoms. I don't care whether you believe in God or you believe in logic, you believe in, in love, you believe in nature. We all believe in something. And when you feel disconnected and purposeless, that is sort of the beginning of you losing your um, vitality. So all of these are warning signs, not only for you, but for the people you love to recognize when you start to drag. You can go to the next slide. So 
I'll just jump into this, right? Because part of the reason why we put this slide again um, is because we started off talking about trauma and racialized trauma. And, and so we want to remind you, right, of the distinction that, that most of us, ACE's study, Kaiser's study, told us that you can't get to, to adulthood without having experienced more likely multiple traumas. But what we're talking about with racialized trauma is the daily ongoing onslaught of managing racialized discrimination, harassment, bias experiences with those kind of traumas and the cumulative effect that that has on our overall mental and physical health. And, and that is kind of where we're starting so that we can begin to talk about what healing looks like. Next slide. So when we talk about healing racial trauma, you know, I think sometimes mental health professionals think of things like, well, you just got to go to therapy. And um, I'm a believer that, that therapy is, is great for, every, for, for a lot of people, but it's not great for everyone. And to add nuance to that, therapy only works if there's a good fit. You have to trust the person that's across from you. You have to feel like they get you. Um, there's a lot of pieces to the relationship that are important. But when we talk about healing racialized trauma in, in particular, there are many more elements that we want you to think about. One is that your brain um, is, is really important in this. And, and the brain, I don't even have time to go into all the details about why the brain is magical, but the brain stores trauma memories very differently and in a very different place than regular memories. So you have your memories of when you learned how to ride a bike and what happened this morning for breakfast. But trauma memories are stored somewhere else. So when you sit across from someone in therapy, you can effectively avoid all of that stuff because you have to have a different way of accessing it. It is not accessed through traditional, typical narrative recall. So what that means is that in order to really get at those places where the trauma lives, we need alternate interventions, things like um, somatic um, therapies or EMDR, eye movement desensitiz desensitization and reprocessing. Those are mental health treatments that directly impact the brain. We also know that trauma is stored in the body. So this can't be just a brain thing. It's got to be a full body thing. Um, Bessel van der Kolk, if you haven't heard of him, wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. I'll type it in the chat when I'm done with my section. Um, but that book is amazing because it talks about how, it, how trauma shows up in our body. It shows up for us physiologically. It shows up in pain. It shows up in us holding our breath. It shows up in all sorts of places. So part of the healing for trauma means that you've got to do stuff with your body, right? So whether it's about your breathing, whether it's about you moving, whether it's about you doing yoga, like there's got to be a, a physical component too to release some of this. Also, a lot of our traumas happen to our body, so they absolutely ha have to be included in the process. The third bubble is about creativity. Um, create, uh, oh, someone asked about epigenetics. Wow. Okay. Give me a second. Um, creativity is also important. And, and what we know about trauma is that a lot of those trauma memories live in the left brain, right? The left brain, um, it, sorry, the, the stories live in the left brain. The stories about the trauma live in the left brain. The way in which we often release those stories is through activation of the right brain. Okay. The right brain is where your artistic self lives. Where your, cre thank you, Saba, the, where your creative brain lives. All of that is the right brain. So doing things that aren't necessarily storytelling that are, that, that are, or storytelling that is creative is a way to access the right brain. Finding ways to bring your creativity in, whether it's journaling or painting a picture. Again, not only left brain, but incorporating, incorporating creativity. And the last way that the suggestion we have for, for healing um, racialized trauma is, is mindfulness. And we're going to talk about some resources in a little bit, but just the exercise that we did is an example of how you slowing yourself down, how you soothing yourself, how you regulating, something as simple as you eating regularly, sleeping a regular amount of time can be mindfulness practices, grounding your thinking that keep you from spiraling or falling down that rabbit hole. You know, somebody um, asked about epigenetics, and we don't have the time to go into as much detail about that. But, you know, Joy DeGruy has written um, some wonderful, she wrote the book Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And one of the things she talks about in that book is how Black people in particular are carrying 
epigenetics that come from slavery. There's been some great research that talks about how, like, for example, Jewish folks carry Holocaust trauma stuff. We absolutely carry slavery stuff. So now the conversation comes into you're not just dealing with what you see on the police about George Floyd, but you're dealing with all of that ancestor trauma that occurred before you. And that indeed is very heavy. You can go to the next slide. So, so for me, clinically, this means, and I think this is information for, um, provi let me back up. So one of the questions in the chat was, how do we heal racial trauma while it's happening? Um, one of the things that we need to recognize is that we cannot control external elements. You cannot, we are working really hard through, through forums like this to talk about how we can consciously come to a community and create changes, right? We, as a community, we can cha make policy changes. We can make advocacy changes. We can make on the ground changes. But while that is happening, you have got to find a way to manage your own reaction so that you are not spiraling, okay? Uh, many of you talked about feeling heavy and feeling tired. We have been dealing with this our whole lives, right? This didn't start with George Floyd. This has been going on for years. So, so one of the best ways to start healing is to take care of you. This means, this means acknowledging that, no, you're not okay. This means acknowledging that you need some help. This means being willing and courageous enough to implement some new techniques so that you can take care of you. So some of these, some of these warning signs are things to pay attention to. And, and so if this means that you pick one or two things that you are willing to try, those go a long way towards healing. So do some yoga, right? Be willing to, I ordered these paint by numbers kits off Amazon. Let me tell you, that is, it sounds corny, but that thing has changed my life. I'm over there focusing for three hours on some stupid little number. It impacts my right brain, right? I do meditation. There is a site, um, what's it called? Insight timer. Have you all, have you all heard of that? It, this is, have you all heard, Saba, have you heard of this? Insight timer? Right? It is that an sound, app? It's an <laughs> app. It has, it has sound bath on it. It has spiritual healing stuff on it. Like there are a lot of, yes. of, of opportunities out here that, that, that we can utilize, but we have to be willing to do something different. And so part of this, um, this, this slide here is about helping providers shift their climate, right? If you are going to provide, yeah, there's a free version too, by the way, let me say about that, because I am always down right. to a free version of an app and to not buy it and to get it for free. Um, so that's a worthwhile investment. Um, but, but providers, we are really learning these days to take a trauma-informed perspective. Um, what we are encouraging you to do is combine that trauma-informed perspective with a critically conscious lens, right? So those same, those same five categories of safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, and empowerment, which are important for trauma-informed treatment, can also be applied using a critically racially conscious lens. Right? So that we're thinking with every client that comes in that they have a story, that they have identities that we can't necessarily identify from looking at them. So we got to be interested in them. Right? And then we're always talking about how people can be safe because Rhiannon and LaRae and Saba's story all tell us that everybody has history that they're not necessarily talking about. They have history that makes them feel unsafe. Right? And that everyone has traumas that have had an impact on them. When we talk about choice, almost every experience of racism or, or discrimination is one where the person who was targeted did not have any options, right? So that, so, and trauma does the same thing. So recognize that people need in, 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 in provider therapeutic context to have choices. Even if they're little choices, we all, even if somebody has to be hospitalized, right? If, if I have to, Rhiannon's story was great. If I have to hospitalize you, I'm at least going to give you the integrity of, if I can, of bringing your pillow, of bringing your pajamas, right? I'm going to give you a choice so that you are not without any consent, right? Collaboration is another piece, right? We want to always collaborate, not only with our clients about who they are and what their cultural and spiritual needs and norms are, but we got to know who they are to have a real rapport. We also want to collaborate with all our other treatment providers. And if you really want people to be 
involved in the work you're doing, you have to give them a space to be honest about how they're experiencing you. Okay, I say that, and I want to pause with that one, because you, if you say to somebody, do you like the work I'm doing? Is it helpful? They're always going to say yes, especially if you have more, if you have more mainstream identities and they don't. But if you consistently inquire about how culturally re relevant the work is that you're doing, people will be honest with you over time. You just got to give them some space. Similarly, trustworthiness is important, not only with trauma, but also with, with racial background. Um, and, and when there is a boundary violation, I could do a four-hour training on a loan, right? One of the things that people of mainstream identity get mad about are time violations, right? Well, you're late. You must not want it. You know, we have a policy that says we're going to cancel you if you're late more than three times. What if that person is trans and they can't use the regular bathrooms because they might get harmed or killed. So they have to hold their urine or go to specific places around town and can't get to you on time. What if they have to take four buses to get to you? Like recognize the boundary violations for people of mainstream or privileged identities are not the same for people that have marginalized status. So be aware that that is an issue. And the final area as I've been talking about on an ongoing basis is that empowerment is important. We need to be seen and we need to be affirmed and we need to be validated. And until you ask us who we are, you won't be able to do that, right? So people need to tell their stories. Um, and and without, without inquiring about that, you're not going to have the information that you need. So keep in mind, right, these are two pieces to consider, not separate, but together, racially conscious and trauma-informed. Next slide, please. Yeah, Insight Timer rocks. I'm trying to tell you. This is a gem right here. So I've been talking for a while about self-soothing and coping, and, and I just want to clarify that this is your power. This is your power right here. You cannot stop anybody from doing what they're doing. What you can do is you can take care of you. And I have to tell you, I see people of color all day long who refuse to do this. We are all waiting for some mother, some external figure, we're waiting for a spiritual guide, we're waiting for somebody to take care of us. And the truth is, is that they may also be there, but you got to do it too, right? So one of the ways that you can soothe yourself is you can draw a, a line of demarcation in your own experience between your own traumas, your old past traumas, and your current traumas. What happens for most of us is this thing happens and it lights up the pathway to all the other traumas. See, this means I'm a terrible person. See, this means nobody loves me. See, this means I'm responsible. See, 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 that is, that, that is the beginning of the end for all of us. So you got to be able to engage in some self-talk that says, this is not reflective of all these other things. This is what's happening right now. While there are similarities, while my brain is responding to all of that, this current situation is not all of those same stories. Because what happens is when your brain responds to trauma, it goes right to the sympathetic nervous system, right? It goes right into um, survival. It goes right into fight, flight, freeze. And when that happens, any access to your thinking, yourself, your voice, your resources all goes away. So until you soothe yourself, you're not going to be in the right headspace to take care of yourself or anybody else, okay? Take a look at your coping strategies. Do they work? That extra piece of cake is delightful every night and every day and during the day. But it is not helping me. It's making me inflamed. It makes me feel crappy about myself. I can't wear a bathing suit. I, like, I hate myself when I eat cake every day. So it's not an adaptive coping skill that's helpful. Okay? It's not. Be honest when you assess what your skills are. And if they're not, and by the way, it is working in the moment. There is nothing I can control every day except what cake I eat. So that does give me a sense of power. So you got to be honest about what's working about your tools and what's not. And at what point do you, do you get concerned? What, what point do I say this is enough and I need to do something else, right? Those are critical questions you can ask yourself about your soothing and your coping skills so you can employ some alternate methods. Next slide. I talked a little bit about grounding. Grounding is one of the ways that you can self-soothe and engage in mindfulness. And here are some really basic ways that you can ground yourself. Grounding is not the answer, okay? It's not gonna fix anything. 
what it's going to do, it's going to anchor you. I'm guessing that some of you might be anxious. Yes? Is anybody possibly anxious in this audience? Okay. So even our panelists are anxious. Thank you. So those of you that are anxious, spiral. You know what I'm talking about? Spiraling where you either go into the universe or you go in the rabbit hole, right? That's what happens when you're anxious. What grounding does is it anchors you to the ground so you stop the spiral. You got to catch it early, okay? If you wait till you're in the bottom of the hole or at the top of the stratosphere, you're not going to be helpful to yourself. But there are things you can do. And this is, you're at home probably, so you can do this, right? Lay on the ground. Take your shoes off. You're probably not wearing shoes anyway. I don't wear shoes anymore. Put your feet on the floor, right? Squeeze some Play-Doh, right? Go put something on that feels good. Make some tea. Use some essential oils. Take a bath. Light a candle. One of the things that you can do to cognitively ground is you can name like five things in the room. Lamp, light, like yellow table. Like you can name them and, and, and that ground. If you have to describe them, that's the way to do it. Breathing is one of the most, as Saba was demonstrating, is one of the most powerful tools you can use um, and distracting, of course. So these are all things you can do to ground yourself. And if I were you, I would pick one and try it and see if it works. If it doesn't, pick another one and see if it works. Something is going to help you. All we're looking for is you to stop spiraling. Okay? If you can do that, you can stay in your body and you can stay in your mind so that you can respond rather than react, okay? Reactivity is never helpful. Responsiveness is thoughtful and gives you room to make good decisions. Next slide. These are some recommendations for mindfulness. Um, I'm, I included some belly breathing. I included some box breathing. I included some progressive muscle relaxation. I didn't include any prayers, but prayer is also a way to be mindful. Um, I included some meditations, some doing nothing for two minutes, and some yoga. You're welcome to find these on your own, but I just wanted to give you a place to start because we all need some tools. Your job is to develop a toolkit so you can get yourself there. And we're going to make this available to all of you at the end of the, of the training. Yes, you'll get the link. So powerful. I mean, I think a lot of times we talk about self-care, um, but we don't talk about it in the context of actually specific practices that look like self-care, but they're actually healing our trauma and our anxiety. And so I really appreciate just that specificity around because I feel like if you if you talk about it in self care, it's like oh I can put that off. You're like oh self care, yeah yeah yeah. That this is it's that thing that people say is important. But but if you think about it as like I am healing my anxiety and trauma by taking this activity. And and I just wanted to share with the group, this is my this is my grounding tool. It's a it's a crystal. It's a rainbow moonstone. And when I'm sitting on calls and when I'm, um, you know, on, on the phone or on a webinar, I have it. And it's a grounding tool for me that, that, I, that I use uh, quite often. And um, another tool that sounded, um, resonated with me and, and sounded um, similar to a practice that I do. Uh, so that piece that Dr. Wendy was saying, just name like the yellow vase and like, name things that are around you to ground yourself. A lot of times if I'm feeling anxiety, I just say out loud, I'm feeling anxiety. And it's amazing how much just saying it out loud will allow yourself to some space and grounding. Um, and so uh, in that vein, I just want to share some more practices. This is uh, from Dr. Tima Brian Davis, um, another uh, clinician that talks about that intersection of trauma-informed care and, and um, uh, critical race theory in the context of um, uh, uh, complex uh, healing, complex, the complex trauma of oppression. And I just, you know, a lot of these practices, like I'm also thinking about like ancestral practices that, that we have in our lineage, um, uh, I like say dance. And you know, it's like, oh, that's cultural, that's a, a thing of this, of my culture, but it's, a, it's actually a healing it's a way of healing, and it's a way of being in community together. 
and using our universal commonalities as human beings. And so um, it's, it's therapy and, um, and it's freeing. And so go ahead, like, like Dr. Wendy said, you know, you're not wearing shoes anyway. No, you're at home. <laughs> go ahead and turn up the music and have yourself a dance party and say, oh, well, yeah, I took care of my mental health today. Um, or, you know, go ahead and sing that song and loud at the top of your lungs, you know, and enjoy it. Because you know what? You're also breathing when you sing. And that's, that's extremely hearing, healing as well. And what I love about these practices that she lists is that they're ones that you can do with other people. So many of the providers that we have on the call, I think I saw a question around, like, what, what are some practices that we can take? These are some practices you can take with your clients and with your tenants um, and, and with your family and with your, your, your community. So, and they're, like I said earlier about our meditation, it's, 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 super restorative and healing to do it on my own. And it's a different kind of restoration and healing when I do it in a community as we did together. And, um, and, and these things are fun. And so having fun is just so vital uh, to our well-being. And I want us to um, take a moment with our last few minutes to practice, um, to practice one of the uh, li th things that's listed here around um, uh, art, art-based activities. So, you know, a lot of us, I think culturally or, or white, maybe white supremacy might say that um, art is extraneous. Um, uh, even though we do have quite a number of cultural art institutions, uh, I know for me when I go to, to uh, look at um, classic art, like I get annoyed because I don't see people that look like me. Um, but but there are so many forms of art that can be healing to us. And like Dr. Wendy said, just that, you know, those little color by number things are huge. But I want us to, to play with the art of poetry. Oh, and laughter. Thank you for, for naming that. That's, um, that's also a meditation, a laughter meditation that you can do. Um, just laugh for one minute. In fact, LaRae led us in a meditation like that the other day. So, um, but let's practice this, this, uh, this poetry exercise. So, if I was a color, my spirit would be, so if anyone wants to enter uh, the end of that poem, and uh, maybe Emma, if you can type that in for me. Oh, someone said yellow already. If I was a color, my spirit would be what and why? Or, if I was an animal, I would be what? and why. So I see here, if I, uh, purple, blue, green, ooh, all of a sudden I see those images. If I was a color, my spirit would be mint, um, <laughs> hot pink, peanut butter. See, I'm even making a poem just reading you guys' beautiful comments. Um, red is joyful, ooh, a lion, because I'm fierce. Oh, giraffe, like suddenly I'm in the jungle. So that thing of engaging your imagination is just such a freeing practice that we have available to us at all times. Um, and it's just so beautiful. And so I just want to credit Dr. Tima uh, Davis for that little um, activity on poetry. But, oh, a red-headed finch. You don't think about that kind of a uh, bird very much. Um, so, but there are many different ways you can practice these things. So, uh, and you can play and you can even, in, in community say, okay, well, we're going to choose one of these today. Someone like come, come up with a uh, dance for us to learn. Um, and so play, play is also just that playfulness and playing with each other engages that part of your brain and allows you some relief. And so I just wanted to note, I, I can't say enough, like I, Dr. Wendy, like, will you please run for president? Like, we just <laughs> love you. <laughs> Thank you for, I mean, just especially that intersection around trauma and uh, racial trauma and trauma-informed care. That intersection of critical race theory and trauma-informed care is, is so magical and, and, and golden and um, brilliant. And we just really appreciate your work so much in this space. And I just wanted to um, highlight for all of us, yes, see, we have some agreement, Dr. Wendy for president. Um, it's starting. <laughs> um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll be Kanye. <laughs> 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 
right? You could be our next Kanye. Uh, I mean, I, I might, not not that. I mean, <laughs> no, sorry, no, no. <laughs> right, give me some prayers. Um, so, yeah, and I like that. It is. It's, it's good to kind of laugh. I see some laughter happening. So this is our healing too. Uh, but I encourage you to read up on um, Dr. Wendy Ashley's publications. The, this voice and and um, you know this perspective is what we really need to spread in the work. Um, and and this perspective around healing and and the practices that we covered today. Um, I'm just so exciting that, excited that we could share that together so that it really goes out into our communities. And this is a national platform. So, um, and, and many people are asking, will these slides be available? Yes, we will make them available to you. Um, and so I just want to pass this, this uh, slide to um, Ms. Diaz, one of her favorites. Um, as, uh, as we close out this webinar, um, I'd like to send you off with a little prayer. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live your life with ease. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ree. And actually, hey, we have a couple. We did it. We do have some time, Wendy. We were like, <laughs> we're not going to have time. We have time for questions, everyone. So don't hang up yet. Um, uh, look at all that, all the thank yous uh, and so the hugs and kisses. Um, we love that. We feel it. And thank you so much for that beautiful energy. But so um, do folks have questions? Uh, I'm looking for them. I have a few, Saba, that I saved oh. um, from the chat. Um, Great. This one is thank from you, Rebecca Stitch, um, and she asked earlier, um, on a policy level, one wonders how we can make clear when someone calls to get help for someone in crisis that the right team is sent. As a general community member, I might know that a person is clearly having a mental health problem, but see that they need help. So who do I call to get them that help? And I think this was referring to um, the idea that the police might not be the best people to respond <laughs> to a mental health crisis. Mm, that's a terrific question. Wendy, do you want to uh, start start with our response or? Um, go ahead. I'll jump in. Go ahead. I'll jump in. Um, I think I think that's part of the issue uh, that I think we as a society, it's like nine one one is called for everything, and we don't even know who our local um, mental health providers are. And in fact, people working in that space have the, like the, the salaries for those positions, um, you know, some of the work that folks do in uh, uh, crisis response in terms of homelessness, those positions are really um, tough. People burn out and they don't get paid well enough. So I think we need to amplify those professions as a response to crises um, versus the police. And we need, and until that happens, we need to kind of get to know who those community organizations are and how we can support them too. And, and maybe start with making investments in our local um, mental health uh, uh, community uh, organizations so that, so that they can have the capacity to, to respond um, like a 911 service would. And so I know from a policy perspective, uh, we, need to, we need to really advocate for policies that will allow for that. And I think the defund the police movement is a really powerful moment for us to advocate for those agencies to be bolstered economically, for the money to come directly from the budgets, because a lot of the police officers don't want to do that work. They, they're not qualified to do that work. And it's, and it's like every, so much is thrown um, to them. So, so from a policy perspective, we just really need to advocate that those monies get invested into um, community, um, community mental health organizations. And until then, we need to get to know our communities and we need to get to know those organizations and find out how we can support them. 
Yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about are sort of two different objectives. There's a short-term objective and a longer-term objective, right? The longer-term mm -hmm. objective is to create these systems where we don't have them. A lot of people are responding in the chat that there is like a 998 or 988 in New York and there's a 311 in Chicago. Um, and, and so we don't have that yet. I mean, there's like 211, but that's not like anybody. There's a 211. Um, yeah. But, but I, I think that there's a couple of things. I mean, so in the meantime, Saba's recommendation is, is, is valid. Like we need to find out who in each of our communities is offering this kind of intervention. Um, and, and then the other part is that there are all sorts of grants and there's funding being offered. This is a great time to get some money to establish something like this. So if your agency and your organization has the capacity to initiate something like that, Take a look at what they're doing in New York. Take a look at what they're doing in Portland. Take a look at what they're doing in, in, in Missouri um, and build something for us because <laughs> we can use what we have in the meantime, but we absolutely need to have a different system in the longer term. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Emma, do you have another question for us or should we? Um... I do. Yeah, there's okay. a question um, here. How can staff mitigate the lack of awareness of colleagues surrounding racial trauma when their perspectives are so entrenched in the institutionally racist perspective. So what can you do um, in your job? I think it's specifically what the question is asking about. Can I start? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to stick my foot all the way in this one. Um, so there is a huge difference between not being a racist and being anti-racist. Okay, those are very different positions. So you could be someone who's, you know, not racist and loves everybody and has an ideology that's loving. But if you're going to take an anti-racist position, you got to be ready to confront this stuff. Like that positioning, and none of us want to do that. We're all terrified of how we're going to get beaten up and fired and killed and ostracized. But the truth is, is that it means noticing the jokes about that borderline patient or that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that violent black woman. Like that's, that's us busting those stereotypes. That's us confronting the systemic racism. That's us asking questions. My, my belief is that your biggest empowerment is to be curious. Watch your tone, be curious. Huh, I wonder if that's about her behavior or if there's an element about that that comes from systemic racism. Pause. Mm -hmm. Right? Job. We got to learn right how to job. do this. We got to learn how to do this. Curiosity. That's right, Jerry. Compassionate curiosity. Yes, Jewel. If you bought what's it, uh, Kendrick, uh, what's his name, um, who wrote the book, uh, how, to be, uh, the, uh, the how to Be Anti Racist? Rock. Kendi. Those are, so, yeah. what his name? what's his name again? Kendi. Ken yeah. Kendi. Eva Max. Yes, mm -hmm. those are those are great um, resources that are going to help you find the language and the skills to be able to confront this tiny bit by tiny bit. Sorry, go ahead, Baba. Mm -hmm. No, that's such a great question, and I know that um, you know oftentimes, like uh, staff of color are seeing things and experiencing things, um, and it feels like it takes a lot of bravery to to navigate that and manage your own racial trauma. Um, but yeah. I think that to the extent that, you know, you can really bring yourself to the, to the work and, and, um, and first off thinking about your comfortability, but to the extent that you can share um, some experiences with, with colleagues, I know, and in and, and my organization at our staff meeting, we are now talking about race. Um, we're talking about in the context of our work, but, but we're also building a lot of trust to be able to kind of share some of our experiences, especially as staff, uh, those of us that are uh, staff of color. And by sharing stories, that's really a way to engage people in, in, in understanding. I mean, I feel like storytelling is like, one of our the, the fundamental, I mean, people have been telling stories since we were sitting by fires. And so that's really um, always an available way to engage people. And, and Rhiannon and Larray, the way they, they storytell, I mean, it just like puts you in a different headspace where you can really start to kind of um, observe and experience and make these connections. And um, so I think storytelling is, is is really powerful. 
Um, and to the extent that you can advocate for, um, for more education around this issue um, in the context of your work is, is really, yeah. really excellent. Like that's a really important entry point. There's so many resource out, resources out there um, to be able to do that. Um, and whether it be training, whether it be like required reading, um, just advocating in your organization um, to, to, to really look at this from an academic standpoint is another way to, to really start to unpack how that applies to your culture and how then that can apply to, to the culture of, of, of um, the organization and the, the experiences of the tenants and, um, and just expanding that consciousness that we talked about at the, at the beginning of, the, um, of, of our time together. Any opportunities to do that, I think, um, through either education or through storytelling are always welcome. And look, we only have one more minute. Do we have time for one more question? Can I, can I just, can I oh, add yeah, something to that? Yes, well, please. I, just wanted, I just wanted to go back to what we did at the beginning, which is where we asked people where they were at. And a lot of people said they were feeling heavy and they were feeling, um, they were, and, and I hear this from every client of color that I have, that they are very fatigued with all the weight of what's happening right now. And I say all that because I do think we have a responsibility to say something when we see these things happening, but, but people of color cannot be the only ones to carry this. Every social movement, every social justice movement has allies. And so this is a good time to collaborate with our allies, our white bodied allies, um, our, our male bodied allies to let them carry some of this. And, and, and there's enough mm. folks out there that can help share the load so that we're not all doing it um, alone. That's so beautiful and such an important point to end on. And especially in our, this virtual circle we have um, to think about our colleagues, our community, and, and that we're not carrying this alone. This is something that we all have to participate in and, and that we have people to support us. So um, I just can't tell you how appreciative I am of being with um, Ray, Wendy, Rhiannon, and, and all of you today on this journey that we've had really together. And <laughs> I feel like I've been on a journey um, and uh, really appreciate all the beautiful questions. And um, we will uh, maintain contact in terms of responding to any questions we didn't get to. And be well, people. Um, be well, our friends. Um, we really appreciate you. And if you will take um, the, tell us how we did. Um, uh, and I think Emma, is that going to be um, a survey that they get? In the chat. Yep, I put the link in the oh. chat. So we just love to hear, okay. hear your feedback. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being who you are in the world. And thank you for for sharing time in this really important topic. Um, any last good goodbyes from the, the other panelists, my esteemed panelists? Oh, thank you. Uh, that was a sweet wave from Rhiannon. Um, all right, everyone, have a wonderful, beautiful day. Thank you again. <laughs>